Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. What event logs? Part one, attacker tricks to remove event logs. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Matt Bromley, SANS instructor and incident responder. If during the webcast you have any questions for, for Matt, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded, and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Matt. Awesome. Thanks, Carol. And uh, good uh, morning, afternoon, evening to uh, everyone who's joined, depending on, on where you are in the world. I know a significant part of the U.S. is under some sort of a cold freeze right now, so if you're uh, watching this from the warmth of a fireplace, I envy you. Uh, right now it is a little warm where I'm at, but it's going to get very cold tonight. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to being able to snuggle up and do some more event log research. In any event, thank you again for joining. Um, the presentation I've got uh, for everyone this morning is part one of a two-part series where we're going to dig into um, the usage of event logs by attackers and then how we as investigators or we as analysts can, can work around that. Um, as to how we can work around the lack of evidence being there. Um, and a lot of organizations that I work with have such a heavy dependency on Windows event logs as their sole source of visibility into their enterprise, where I, I, I kind of have to pose the question every time of, okay, what if I take your event logs away? What's next? You know, and uh, we're going to talk about what some of those options look like. Um, this is part one. Part two will be in a week, same place, same time. Uh, and uh, I will talk more about that as uh, we get toward the end of the presentation. All right, so let's uh, let's look, take a look at what we're going to be talking about today and, and some of the things that I'm going to cover. I'm going to first get into the basics of event logs. Now, if you're a seasoned investigator or a seasoned Windows system administrator, the basics may seem a little familiar, but it's important that we understand a couple things about Windows event logs in order to understand how the various attacker tools uh, take advantage of them. Then we're going to get into some attacker techniques, um, what thing, some of the things that they're using to circumvent the usage of event logs. And then we're going to talk about how you as an organization, how you as an analyst can, can mitigate these. How can I get past these? How can I start to posture my enterprise to think beyond just Windows event logs? All right, so let's get into the basics. So again, some of this may seem very, very familiar to some seasoned analysts or system administrators. There's basically two parent categories of event logs, as I, as I like to frame it. Um, anything prior to Vista falls into the first category to the left. Anything after Vista falls into the category to the right. Again, we're at 100,000 foot here. Um, XP and Server 2003 maintains an EVT extension. There's really three main logs that will be on a system. I'm just going to stop right there and say that if you've got Windows XP or Server 2003 systems in your environment and it is not mission critical, your first priority right now is not how can I capture these event logs, it's how can I upgrade my systems. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the differences between these two formats. I'm going to focus on the modern event logs that are being used by the Vista Plus systems. So please note, you know, if you can upgrade those systems, if you can't and you find yourself doing analysis in these systems, and I ran into an XP system, you know, three days ago, so they're definitely still out there. I'm not, not saying they don't exist. Um, but my first recommendation is focus on, uh, on upgrading, if you can. With regards to the differences in quantity of logs, that's an important thing to note as well. There's three main logs on the XP 2003 and below systems. For Vista and above, there's dozens to potentially hundreds of logs. This system that I'm presenting on right now has 368 Windows event logs. Notice the path is different. The path is different. It's a dedicated storage folder. And then we get things like our built-in Windows logs. There still is a security log, an application log, and a system log. Those are the three core Windows logs, if you will. There's also unique applications, um, the unique services. You'll have a log for DHCP. You'll have a log for RDP. You'll have a log for task scheduler, for services, so on and so forth. You're also going to get third-party apps as well. Um, if you've got a Lenovo machine, for example, Lenovo writes to event logs that are located in this directory. AV may write to this directory. If you are investigating a database system, um, Microsoft SQL Server will tap into this location as well. So it's not just 
the operating system by itself, you're going to get a lot of third-party data in this location as well. That is, and I'll talk about this in just a moment, but yet another reason why upgrading is key because it just gives you more visibility. To focus on kind of some of the differences here, again, this is just a screenshot uh, uh, from my current system. Um, notice that the Vista Plus logs, they get extremely detailed. Um, we get into things like uh, RDMS, service buses, user experience, virtualization. There's a lot of things that you may not be utilizing as, uh, as an investigator. You know, everyone's kind of standard go-to is the system log and the security log and things of that nature. But if I take those logs away from you and all of a sudden you find yourself looking at some of these auxiliary logs, you're going to see a lot more benefits in them, um, especially if you don't have the other data to pull from. Uh, the RDP logs for example, are going to provide a lot of information that the security log may not be able to provide. We'll talk about that when we get to mitigation. Windows does have a native event viewer, and the reason I included this portion to the right of the screen is to take a look so you understand how Windows and how Microsoft separate these log types. Again, you've got your core Windows log, if you will, and then everything else falls under applications and services. So again, the key takeaway here is note that Vista and above, you're going to have a much richer quantity and a higher population of logs. That's the set that you want to be going after because, hey, we want more evidence, right? As analysts, as investigators, as system administrators, as enterprise defenders, network defenders, I want as much data as I possibly can. Now, let's talk really quickly about how the event log service runs on a system. What exactly is happening under the hood? There is no eventlog.exe that runs and keeps track of everything that takes place. And this is, this is where I say, this is where we need to understand the structure of how the event log service runs in order to understand the structure of how our attackers abuse and take advantage of these systems. So first here, I start at the service. I have an event log or a Windows event log service. Its name is really straightforward, event log, right? No surprises there. Um, and it's associated with PID 1968. As I said, eventlog.exe does not exist. This is actually an instance of SVC host.exe. There is an instance of SVC host that is spawned in order to help manage and run the event log service. That's what's containing that particular, um, particular data and controlling the access to those files. Notice linking across all of our PIDs here, the SVC host instance that is loaded then load the DLL called wevtsvc.dll located inside of system32. That's actually what contains the code that's utilized to interact with, to write with, to um, interact, uh, sorry, to respond to these events and to make sure that they're recorded um, inside of our event logs. Believe it or not, uh, if you go take a look at that DLL, um, if anyone goes and just runs strings on it, you're gonna see a lot of templates for a lot of your event log messages. It's a really good information source. So again, we have a service, that service ties to the SVC host executable. The SVC host executable relies on the WEVT SVC DLL. Linking these two together here, we can actually link up and see what the command line looks like for that. Um, the path is SVC host, but the actual command, of course, we have our dash K switch. By the way, if I've got any uh, 508 alumni, um, or any memory forensic alumni on watching the webcast right now, you know full well that if we see an SVC host without that dash K, we've got a problem. Um, refer to your blue posters, SANS alumni, in order to track that down. But uh, tying this PID together, we can see the DLL, the full command that's run. So we have an idea of what we may be looking for. Now, this starts to feel a little bit, you know, memory forensic-ish. We'll get there in just a moment. Um, but for now, just note that there are some key qualities about the event log service that we need to understand. So because it's a process, because it is a particular service that has a DLL loaded, there's lots of other resources we can tap into as well to understand what's happening, to understand how our logs are being interacted with and how they're impacting our system. One of the first places you can do is load up a procmon, if you will, or load up a, a sysmon instance or whatever it is you may use to get granular detail. And you can see, do I have anything that ties these in, that ties these instances together? Sure enough, if I take a look at my system, I've got PID 1968, SVC host.exe, interacting with a whole slew of Win EVT registry keys. This is definitely along the lines of what I would expect to see. Taking a look at some additional information, again, focusing on PID 1968, all I'm doing is just confirming what I know, is that there is a process 
that is intertwining itself and that is responsible for the event log uh, process, sorry, for the event log service, for the event log handling, for the writing. Now, the goal of these past few slides was not to uh, continually reiterate the point that an executable is responsible for event logs. It's to give everyone a few different options in order to track this information down. I am not expecting that you're able to right-click properties every single system on your enterprise. Uh, I understand that you know some folks here are managing tens, if not hundreds of thousands of systems, and you need a faster way in order to track some of this down. If you've got that level of system granularity, you're able to look and see, okay, what process is a handle on my event logs? That's my event log service. That's my SVC host. We'll talk about doing this in a dead forensics manner um, in a little bit. But again, multiple ways on a live system to track down. Now, because it's a process, because it's a PID, we know that all processes have threads. Threads are the workhorses that actually make the things happen for us. This is going to be the most granular part of what's taking place here. The threads that are spawned in order to handle the writing, reading, whatever it may be of these particular events, these are kind of the ones that are actually, you know, doing the, the heavy lifting for, for lack of a better term for us. Keep this in mind. Don't forget processes have threads and threads are doing the work. We've got to keep that in mind. If you'll notice, I started at the very top. I started at a service name. I'm going to jump back here really quick. If you've got a lag on your screen, don't worry. It'll catch up in just a second here. Remember, I started at the very top, which is my event log service. I whittled it down to a process, to a PID, that PID to some of its DLL, or a DLL that's being loaded. I can whittle that down to the command line. I can look at the events taking place, and then I can get all the way down to the threads that are being run as well. So we're able to map out the entire event log process, if you will, or the event log service and its associated processes on my particular system. All right, now I've laying that groundwork. Keep this in mind because this is going to be super important when we get to how attackers look at your system. By the way, if I've got anyone watching who's done some form of blue teaming um, and may not be too familiar with the red team side of things, understanding the processes and how they do what they do to this level of granularity is one of the key ways that attackers are successful in exploiting systems, is knowing all the different links in the chain and testing and prodding, seeing if one is weak. Can I remove it? Can I take it away? Can I stop it? What can I do? So we'll talk about that exploit in, uh, in just a moment. But yes, make sure you understand how this is being written, how it interacts with your system. All right, with the basics out of the way, let's get to the part that I think everyone is super interested in actually seeing, which is how are attackers actually doing what they're doing? Now, I've pulled a, a handful of techniques that I see used in the wild um, and when I say used in the wild, I want to say all four of these were likely used, I want to say within the past, um, probably within the past three months. Um, so we're not talking years. Uh, we're talking within the past three months um, used by either extremely prolific, well-known threat groups. Uh, I've seen a couple used by like your one-off attackers and whatnot. But nonetheless, um, you know, whilst they may seem proof of concept, I'm sure everyone knows, uh, especially if anyone's familiar with the work by Daniel Bohannon, um, his uh, PowerShell obfuscation tools, you know that as soon as something hits GitHub, it's fair game to be used in a breach. Uh, a lot of the APT groups are paying attention to some of the latest red team side projects and weaponizing them very, very quickly. So um, we are going to see, you know, methods that, that our attackers are using. The first one, really straightforward. Just clear them. Just get them out of the way. Just take those event logs and just make them unavailable to anyone who looks. Now, you may be thinking, did I really just join to watch someone tell me to clear event logs? You may think to yourself, this is the most basic and straightforward approach that you could take, and they are being used. There's actually, and I'll, this is on my next slide here, there's actually a group that is still active right now. One of their key tactics, one of their TTPs throughout their breach cycle is to clear event logs. Uh, it used to be one time, now it's repeated. Event logs, if you're not familiar, can be cleared from the command line or from the GUI. Important to note that it can be done from both because it depends on what level of, of access your attacker has to a system. A couple screenshots here just to show you what that looks like. The WEVT util, if anyone here has, has done any sort of event log work before and you have not gone on the Windows command line, I encourage you to go check that tool out for two reasons. Number one, command line always makes your life easier because you don't need a mouse anymore. And number two, 
I guarantee you the attacker that's coming after your network is familiar with how to use that tool on the command line. So for free, built into Windows, get on their level and make sure you're familiar with what those commands mean. Um, when we, you know, we won't talk about process auditing today, but if you have an environment where you're doing some form of process auditing or you're able to get insight into uh, command, command, uh, sorry, command arguments that are being issued, knowing what WEVT util can do can help you answer questions a lot faster instead of uh, you know, hoping to get a copy of what the attacker had. So again, this is utilized by threat actors. There is one financially motivated group. If anyone here has worked uh, financial cases or PFIs before, you may have come across the term uh, raw POS, raw paws. Um, Fire Eye Mandate refers to them as FIN5. Uh, I've had quite a ball investigating these guys over the past few years, guys and or gals uh, without knowing. Um, they actually have as part of their TTPs, they will clear event logs. It used to be on the way out the door. This group was very good at clearing event logs as part of their cleanup procedure. Um, they used to have a, a very nice exit plan where they would burn down all their malware, get rid of all their output files, securely delete everything, and then clear event logs on the way out as well. Um, we've seen evidence of some groups now actually clearing event logs at every stage of the life cycle. So if you think it's a pain in the butt not to have them at the end of a breach, Imagine not having your event logs during the middle of a breach. And what I mean by that is they will escalate privileges and clear all event logs. They will deploy malware as services, clear all event logs. They will move laterally using PS exec, clear all event logs. All of these things drop remnants in the event logs and then they just clear them. They just wipe them away. Um, this group's also capable of clearing uh, multiple logs as well. They don't, they don't hang out with just one. They'll also blow away the security and the system logs too because they know the, uh, the benefits that are inside of there. Of course, if you've cleared event logs before, you know that uh, on the surface, there's always evidence that logs have been cleared, which is the very evidence of a log being cleared. Oddly enough, clearing event logs creates an event log entry. It's the only one left, and it says the audit log was cleared. This is a sometimes a scary phrase for some sysadmins or for some uh, network monitors to see is to see a audit log was cleared alert come across the wire because it means that event logs are being cleared. There are some organizations that I've worked with, actually worked with an energy company last year. The clearing of event logs, this particular phrase and the associated event ID that I'll show you in a second, pops an alert in their SOC. It's not part of normal procedure. So there's one mitigation tip right there. If you've got a SOC that's ingesting event logs, flag on this alert if it's not part of your standard procedure. If your sysadmins do not clear event logs, there's no reason for them to clear event logs, you should be alerting on this because it's going to tell you something is amiss. Easiest anomaly detection you'll ever get. Now, I've been in some situations where it is normal standard practice and the attackers take advantage of it. And they say, ah, I know the logs are gonna be cleared at midnight. I'll just do all of my work between 11 and 12 a.m., 11 p.m. and 12 a.m. And then all my evidence will get deleted anyways. So. Um, you know, make sure you know what is normal inside of your enterprise. The other nice little artifact, and again, we're putting on our forensic hat here. The other nice artifact we get out of the event log being cleared is I know what username you were using. I know what account you were using inside of there. So even if you're trying to walk out the door and you're clearing all the event logs, you're sweeping up after yourself, you're locking, you're making everything look nice and pretty, you basically just left your driver's license on the table. So how effective really were you at that point? Because now I found your account. And if I know the account that you used, I just opened up another world of forensic artifacts. How do we mitigate and detect against this particular technique? Number one, forward logs to a sim. Attackers can clear event logs locally very, very, very easy. It's much more difficult to get into a sim and blow away the history of event logs that are there, especially if that data is being backed up, being saved somewhere else. You should be forwarding event logs standard. Now, I'm not saying every system everywhere, right? There's some systems that you just don't need that data. They sit in dev environments. They're meant to be messed with. They're, uh, you know, they're segmented and they're protected. And if an attacker gets into them, there's nothing sensitive. But if you've got a system with sensitive data or you've got a sensitive subnet inside your network, those logs should be forwarded to a SIM or to a collector somewhere. And you can forward logs from one Windows system to another Windows system for free as well. So I don't want to hear the argument of, oh, we couldn't afford this or, oh, we couldn't implement that. You can do this for free. Hard drives are cheap, y'all. Go buy a couple, 
Make sure you've got a central server and at least the crown jewel systems, right? That database that contains those social security numbers or those credit cards or that system that contains all your IP and blueprints. Make sure those logs are being backed up somewhere because you're going to need them and make sure they're being shipped as soon as they're written. You can go clear them if you want, but then I'm going to be able to have a historical resource to go to. As I said earlier, some folks will monitor for that particular phrase. The security event log clearing ID is 1102. Some sims, if 1102 pops up, it immediately jumps to the highest analyst on the clock, and that person goes and figures out what's happening. You should be able to account for every event log clearing in your environment if they're legitimate. It should be part of some sort of sysadmin deployment feature. I actually helped a client about 18 months ago where their standard thin client deployment procedure was deploy the VM, clear the event logs, and then the user would log in. So their sim was popping up. They was blowing up when we were flagging for 1102 alerts. We found out it was because it was normal procedure. We were able to baseline that. We were able to understand that and then say, okay, anything during this time or around these events is normal. Everything outside of that, outside of a client provisioning, we knew it was going to be bad. If you find yourself looking at a system with event logs cleared and you did not take my free advice and freely ship your event logs from one system to another, you may be able to peek back in time a little bit. See if on your system you've got volume shadow copies. The funny thing is volume shadow copies contain a lot of historical data for systems and the most efficient campaign at removing volume shadow copies is unfortunately ransomware. Ransomware does a very good job of blowing this away. A lot of advanced attackers, not so much. So believe it or not, they're actually leaving behind a lot more evidence that they know about. Now, of course, I'm sure at least one person watching is saying to themselves, wait, there's a caveat here. I need to have volume shadows enabled. Yes, you definitely do. But with those enabled on particular systems, you may be able to get some historical insight into, uh, into what's going on there. Again, you may have a volume shadow copy from 24 hours ago or 24 hours prior to the event log being cleared. So you're not going to get everything. You're not going to get the most, the most relevant or potentially the most or the newest information, but it may give you something. Remember, event log clearing is not typically the first thing an attacker does. We'll talk about that in just a second. You, all, you may also be able to recover event logs from systems as well. Again, it's a file. If it's deleted, if it's erased, that evidence may be thrown into unallocated. That evidence may be saved somewhere in the system. We may be able to capture a memory image and dig out those events out of it there. Remember, event logs are handled. They're held in memory. Remember when we saw that the uh, that screenshot from Procmon earlier, and we saw that our particular event log process had handles into all those event logs. If it's got a handle into the event log, then its data is in memory. So maybe gone from disk, but I may still have some remnants in memory there. And then last but not least, attackers will often clear one. They may clear security or they may clear system, but they don't clear, or at least they normally don't clear, task scheduler, remote desktop, services, DHCP, all those other pieces of information that may be useful to your investigation. I kind of contributed to uh, the thought of like, if I give you a puzzle that has two pieces, it's really easy to put together. If I give you the same puzzle, but it's 10 pieces, it takes a little bit longer to put together, but you can still, you know, construct what took place and construct what happened. So that's where we want to utilize those additional event logs that you may see. Yet again, another reason to make sure you're running modern operating systems. You're getting that latest data. All right, let's talk about technique number two. Technique number two is another like really straightforward one. We're not even at the exploits or the fancy mal or the, sorry, the fancy attacker tools just yet. And there are some attack groups out there who will just meddle with event log settings. There's some groups I've seen that just stop the event log service, which is funny. You've got enough privileges that you're able to stop the event log service, but there's a lot of artifacts left by stopping the event log service. But you know what? It doesn't record their particular information. Now, obviously everything up to the stopping of event logs has been recorded. Um, I suppose you could couple an event stopping with an event log clearing, um, you know, and maybe, you know, you'll prevent other things from being stored if you continue working on the system. But it's just another way to, to mess with environments or to, you know, sometimes think that you're covering your tracks. I will be honest. The uh, attack, I don't want to say attack group, but the attackers that I saw using this one, um, they were not using, you know, zero day and super advanced techniques. A, they didn't need to, and B, um, I don't think they understood the forensic implications of just disabling the event log service. Option two 
is to actually modify the event log settings. So you have to know that all these event logs that we looked at before, they're actually controlled via keys in the Windows registry. There's the path for you right there. If any red teamers want to hard code that in so that they can go and mess with these settings. And what do I mean by mess with settings? Well, here's what we've got inside the registry. Things like retention periods. Things like the display name ID, the file name, the file itself. Notice there's another DLL we've got in here as well, WEVT API. That DLL, that is also related to event log operations. Um, but the two big ones here are the file name and the retention period. We could go mess with those a little bit, but believe it or not, I heard about this as a proof of concept last year, saw it with an attack group in the, uh, last year as well, is actually change the event log size. What if I've got an event log that can handle up to 20 megs of data? What if I knock that size down to, I don't know, 10K, 100K, 256K, whatever the minimum may be? What if I go right down to the minimum and then I just flood it with events? I just completely pound the system with all different types of events to where the system can't maintain more than three seconds worth of history. How easy is it then to hide my activity? That's, of course, assuming log entries aren't being chipped off anywhere else. Um, there is a link at the bottom of this slide, and this presentation will be made available afterwards. Uh, a few former colleagues of mine, um, Austin Baker and Jacob Christie, spoke at the Sands Deeper Summit last year and actually walked through this in their slides. And I was like, man, that's a really, that's a really slick technique. And then I saw an attacker do it in October of this year. And um, number one, it confirmed or reaffirmed for me that uh, attackers are watching our forensic presentations. And number two, um, I was like, man, this, this actually it worked for them. They were able to blow away and wipe out a lot of events. There was no log forwarding in place and they were able to lower the size, do all their activity, turn it back up, seem normal to the system admin, but uh, you know, forensically there's a lot of stuff for us to recover there. How do we mitigate this? Again, if I've got logs being forwarded to a SIM, I can look for gaps in stoppage. This is where a SIM becomes super beneficial because a SIM is not just a log collector. It is something that I can base rules around as well. Not only can I forward logs to a SIM, but I can also tell that SIM, if my system stops forwarding logs, tell me. If I go for a period of 12 hours without receiving logs, tell me. I can start to wrap metrics around the actual receipt of logs. I'm not even looking at the content yet. I'm just thinking about the metrics there. If you're monitoring at the system level, Look for things like the event log service being stopped. Again, going back to our registry key here, everyone who's working on forensics or done registry forensics knows that if I dig through and I change some of these registry values, I'm gonna get some timestamps being updated. It seems very weird to me when I've got a registry hive that's three years old and my two event log max size settings are four days old. Everything else uh, you know, dates back to system installation, but max size has been altered with. That's a really easy, hey, sysadmin, did you do this? Nope, I have no idea what you're talking about. All right, there we go. Maybe we figured out what our attackers are doing and how they're taking advantage of it. From a forensic point of view, if you're looking at a dead system or if you're looking at a memory image or a disk image, check that registry. Look for those timestamps. In memory, we can actually go and dump service information out as well. So this is actually output using volatility here. I can dump services from this particular memory image, and I should see the data that we see in here. I should see the binary path. There's my SVC host, my dash K, my local service network restricted, the options and parameters I would expect to see. I've got a process ID of 820. We'll come back to that 820 in just a few minutes, but notice my service name for event log, my Windows event log, and notice that the service was running at the time of memory capture. This service should always be running. If event log service is disabled, you as an investigator need to find out why. Something is wrong there. Normal, normal forensic analysts do not disable event logs to image a system. So if that service is disabled, go figure out why. All right, let's get into the fun stuff now. Let's talk about two techniques that start to get into attacker tool sets and things that have been used in the wild in order to wreak some havoc here. The first one we're gonna take a look at is event log editing with Mimikatz. Now, when everyone thinks Mimikatz, they think credential harvesting, password dumping, oh my gosh, my domain is compromised, tickets, hashes, so on and so forth. Well, Mimikatz has had in it for a little while the ability to also mess with event logs as well. And uh, if you take a look, Mimikatz luckily is open source. You can go look at the code. But Mimikatz is doing some of the same interaction with the EVT SVC DLL. Um, and it's patching that event. We're going to talk about that patch in just a second. Mimikatz, very straightforward. Upload, uh, sorry, um, elevate your privileges. 
to debug. And then we can get two options for event log editing. We can drop event logs or we can clear the logs. Let's walk through the clearing stage first. Notice here's our two options inside of Mimikatz. Mimikatz clear. I start out with a system event log that has about 2,500 or 2,552 entries inside of it. I can run Mimikatz clear, or sorry, event clear. And event clear comes back and says, I went ahead and wiped away the security event log for you. But because all it did was clear the logs, I get that one message left. I get that this log has been cleared once again. So I get that one event left. What did I do in this case? Anything different from just right clicking and clearing the event log? At this point, no. I've got that one entry left. Didn't really do much different for myself. However, this is where the beauty of Mimikatz comes in. Now let's bring in that drop command. So now I'm taking a look at that same event log. There's my one entry remaining in there, right? There's my audit success. Let's go ahead and run Mimikatz event drop. What the event drop does inside of Mimikatz is it actually patches the event log service and it prevents the event log service from writing any additional event logs. Let me reiterate that again for the blue teamers on here and the red teamers who haven't used this functionality yet. By using Mimikatz, I just stopped the event logs from writing. I didn't blue screen. I didn't get any critical Microsoft errors saying something is not right here. I didn't go dig into my services, but Mimikatz applied a patch to the event log service. And now I can go through and clear my event logs. Notice that bottom portion there, event clear. My event logs have been cleared. It successfully wiped away one event. It pulled the population and saw that there was zero left. I just performed activity against a system. That activity by default creates an event log entry. However, with this Mimikatz patch in place, that entry is no longer created. I just introduced a scenario where event logs are now ceasing to exist when it comes to this investigation. They're not there. I don't even have evidence of them being clear. Now, some of you may be arguing, Matt, if I open a system and the system is three years old and the security event log is zero entries, they were obviously clear. You're right, I won't disagree with you there. But if I've got the ability to interact with a system and I've got the privileges to interact with a system to the point where I can disable event logs from being written, what other privileges do I have inside of your domain? That's why Mimikatz is often a tool that should immediately make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up to think, oh my gosh, what else do they have access to? This is actually a really slick little patch because again, it's interacting with the event log service. There is no 1102 error, or sorry, 1102 entry that's gonna be thrown to my SIM at this point if I patch this ahead of time. That's where this tool becomes extremely dangerous, is if I am writing the capability in my SIM to monitor for event log clearing, and I am not receiving alerts when those event logs are being cleared, that's an issue. Because now I've got a system with attackers on it, attacker activity taking place, and I have very little insight into what's going on. That's Again, we'll talk about this in a second, but that's why we need to expand our coverage outside of just Windows event logs. So again, nice little feature of Mimikatz tool, um, really fun. If you haven't uh, if you haven't done this before in your environment, go play around with it. It's pretty pretty cool to see. Um, when if you're an investigator like myself who's really used to opening up the Windows Event Viewer and it's just streams and streams and streams of events, to see those come up blank is uh, is a pretty scary feeling because you know from an investigation point of view, you're uh, you're be missing a few things there. All right, now let's take a look at technique number four, thread disruption. So there's a PowerShell script out there. I would say it's a proof of concept until I actually saw this thing. I will say it was attempted to be used in the wild. The attacker was not successful in using it, but that doesn't mean it wasn't tried. Um, there's a script out there, a PowerShell script called Invoke Phantom. I've actually got a copy to the blog down there at the bottom. And I'll be frank, this picture here, this screenshot, I'm gonna zoom in here on that, is straight from the blog there, primarily because it does the best representation of what exactly is happening here. So let's go all the way back to the very beginning when we talked about the structure of event logs, when we talked about processes having associated threads. No surprise there. The cool thing about Invoke Phantom is Invoke Phantom goes and walks the process tree. It finds the particular SVC host instance that's responsible for the event logs. And then it goes and it finds the threads that are responsible for writing out to the event log. It actually looks for those WEVT SVC threads. 
It goes to see if it can find those specific threads and then it kills them. So what do you have in this case? Well, you've got a process and a service, or sorry, you have a service. You have the services associated process and the associated process is running, the service is running. However, the workers have basically just all gone on strike. So it looks like the building is open. It looks like the business is running, but in fact, there's no work going on or taking place inside. Again, I've got no, no alert to tell me that the event logs have been cleared. And I've got no alert. Windows doesn't blue screen and say, hey, event logs aren't being written anymore. All I've got is threads being killed. The service looks like it's running. The service looks like it's still taking place. If I go and do service auditing across my environment and I try to find everyone that has Windows event log service disabled, this system will not show up. If I go do forensics and pull a memory image, the service will still show as running in this particular case. So what do I do here? I've got event logs that don't write anymore. Again, these two techniques between Mimikatz and between um, Invoke Phantom here, I'm really messing with event logs in a surgical manner. I'm either preventing them from being written or I'm removing evidence that they were ever there and I'm removing the evidence of removing as well. So it's those attackers taking things to the next step and saying, you know what, I'm going to really, really mess with your evidence source and take away your ability to use this reliably. Invoke Phantom is an awesome script, really, really, really well done. I highly encourage anyone who's looking to do low level PowerShell um, introspection where you're really trying to, you know, introspect the system and take a look at the process and thread level, take a look at this script and see how it's put together. Um, it's actually very, very, very well done. Again, another scary tool because it can make everything look normal, but there's no, there's, no, there's no, nothing going on inside there. Now, how do I detect and mitigate Mimikatz and Invoke Phantom? And Invoke Phantom is the name of that script, but let's think of it more as someone meddling with the actual process of event log entry. How do I track events without logs? How do I track events? I, can't, I don't even have a historical way to go recover those. Let's say I've got the most standard server that I run into on a daily basis. No volume shadow copies and attackers compromise it. The threads that are running the event log service were disabled a week ago. And just for fun, Mimikatz was used to wipe the event logs yesterday. What type of analysis can I do? Well, luckily, there's a lot of data that surrounds this type of thing happening that we can look for. Look around the usage of these tools. So let me talk about what I mean by around. An attacker who's looking to take something from your environment or a red teamer whose ultimate goal is to get domain admin and cause issues is not going to pop a system, clear event logs, and drop off and leave that system alone. There is likely some other activity taking place. And this is where it's the most fun to be on the blue side of things, to be on the forensic side of things, is because I can uncover all of your footprints in the snow. How were the logs disrupted? Was it Mimi Cats? Was it something like Invoke Phantom? Do you have some other zero day technique that I don't know about just yet? Notice we didn't get into any shadow brokers tools here, but do you have some other technique I have not heard about that you're using to disrupt these event logs? If so, I'm gonna find evidence of that tool. I'm gonna find a script. I'm gonna find evidence of PowerShell being run. I'm gonna find the Mimi Cats executable. What accounts were being used? Again, it's very difficult to just do this in an isolated manner. You have to use an account to run some of these tools. I'm gonna find that evidence of execution my shim cache, my prefetch, my jump list, my link files, all those things that are gonna to point to you using a user account. Then I'm gonna have a time frame as well. If I have no other threads to pull on whatsoever, I'm gonna be able to go to my sim. I'm gonna to say to my sim, hey, when did the logs stop coming in from this system? Boom, I've got a particular point in time. Remember that the removal of event logs is not an isolated event. There is usually something else taking place some other malware installation, some other lateral movement. Maybe the attacker's trying to cover their pivot point up. Maybe they're trying to cover up pivoting to a system, pivoting from a system, either or. Remember, there's something else that is taking place. How can I do this from a memory forensic point of view? Well, if we take a look at like Invoke Phantom, for example, which remember, killed a lot of threads related with this process, um, I can use memory forensics. First thing I wanna do is find the correct instance of SVC host. Uh, if you'll notice in this particular image here, take a look at that PID at the top of that screenshot. Remember PID 820? That ties back into the service that we had before. So there's a couple ways I could track this down. I could go look for the service, or I could go and look at my DLL list. I could look for the instance of SVC host that's running that has the WIN or the WEVT SVC DLL being loaded. 
Step two is I can then take a look at the associated threads. So I can look to see the threads that are tied to the writing of this event log. So I can get back to that same exact granular level that Invoke Phantom was existing at as well. And then I can inspect those threads a little bit. Now, some of you may be saying from a memory forensic point of view, what are the chances that I'm gonna get a memory dump right next to the time when Invoke Phantom was run? Probably, probably pretty low. Pretty low that you're gonna get a memory dump that close to the attacker activity. But you know what? Memory holds a lot of stuff in it, holds a lot of data that is not overwritten yet. So there's also a thread scan uh, plugin that we could use to potentially look for threads that were killed um, and, but the objects for those are still inside of memory as well. So forensically, there's ways to recover and ways to dig in to this information. All right, with a little bit of time left here, let's look ahead and say, all right, I've looked at a few different scenarios now where event logs can be taken out of my grasp. How can I move ahead in my enterprise and make sure that that is a problem that I will run into as few times as possible? One of the first things you can do, again, upgrade your operating systems. I cannot say the number of times I run into an environment, I ask for event logs, and the response is, oh, that whole subnet is XP or server 2003. My expectation of hundreds just went to an expectation of three. Again, attackers seldom clear them all, so the more logs I can use, the more logs I have, the more visibility I'm gonna get. Another possibility here, ship your logs someplace else. I've talked at length about the use of a SIM already. Get those logs ingested into some other system, but then don't just focus on the collection of logs. Don't just look for those 4624 and 4672 combination events, right? Don't try to match the 4624 and 4625 and you're trying to profile a, you know, account activity. Um, do more than look for IPs during non-standard business hours. Actually focus on the metrics of the systems shipping the logs. Remember I said in the very beginning, if you had to wrap around a handful of systems in your environment that it needs to be the most important data you've got, here's a good metric for a SIM. The database systems that hold my crown jewels should never stop shipping logs. The development environment that houses my billion dollar blueprints or my billion dollar IP should never stop shipping logs. Those are good alerts to look for in your SIM. Look for those anomalies as well. A system that was reporting yesterday but is not reporting today. I would make a fair bet that if you've got a good SIM in place and you're ingesting multiple logs, when you get an event log missing entry error thrown, you're gonna have another entry somewhere else for like an AV instance or PowerShell or whatever it may have been. Other approaches, let's just get back to good old fashioned forensics. I talked earlier about what else happened around the time frame. What types of users were logged into the system? What do my registry keys show me? What do my NT user that DAT show me? How about interactive sessions? Remember, we ran Invoke Phantom as a PowerShell script. We ran Mimikatz as the actual Mimikatz executable. Both of those required an interactive session. If you're just getting started in analysis, let me tell you one thing that's gonna make or break a lot of cases. Interactively logged into a system versus connected over the wire through a command prompt generate significantly different artifacts. If I've got Mimikatz.exe being executed on a local command prompt in a local GUI, there is a ton of artifacts you can go track down there. One of them is gonna be obviously my evidence of execution, my AM cache, my shim cache, my prefetch, my superfetch, all the various different types of evidence of execution my Windows system affords me. We're gonna talk about some more of those when we get into part two next week. How about those third party logs? Can't tell you the number of times the system does not tell me that Mimi Cats was ran. But guess where I do have evidence of Mimi Cats being run? In the AV. The AV will give me a log entry and say, yup, Mimi Katz was here. And of course, what does everyone set their AV policy to? Quarantine by default, right? Block those processes? Nah, definitely not. The number of times I've come across threat found, password stealer, Mimi Katz.exe, action taken, nothing. Well, there we go. I don't even need a Windows event log at this point. I know Mimi Katz was here. I can go over to the prefetch. Oh, look at that. There's a prefetch for Mimi Katz. I haven't even touched Windows event logs. And I know that at a, at a minimum, credentials were likely harvested. So see how we can kind of work around the, ne the necessity of those Windows event logs. If you've got images, bust out those memory images, the closer you are to the breach, the more you're gonna find. Again, if you're close enough, you may actually find evidence of the command history. You may find script segments. You may find pieces of Mimikatz, pieces of Invoke Phantom, pieces of that malware that the attackers are running. Um, the other thing too is, you know what, event logs, because they're, they have open handles 
and they are actually loaded into memory with the expectation they're going to be read, read from and written to, they're going to have artifacts in memory as well. So you might be able to recover a lot more than you think. This is where you want to get out those volatility or those recall plugins, bust out bulk extractor, bust out the Python EVTX library, and really start to dig through that memory image and look for evidence of what's happened here. You know what? There's a lot of, there's, what's that old red team saying that a lot of folks say is uh, all I need is one system. You know what? All I need is one event log entry and I can find out a lot about who you are. So maybe I'll find that one in memory. If you don't have memory images or you've exhausted your search there, go to the disk. Do I have historical data? Do I have event log, sorry, volume shadow copies? Do I potentially have event logs being saved elsewhere on the system? I've run into this a couple times where event logs are being stored in another folder. That's always a fun find is some random folder on the desktop or inside of system 32 and it's marked like, you know, Matt event. And I'm like, what is, what is this, you know, attacker looking folder? And I open it up and it's a copy for copy of event logs. It's just a backup. The attackers never got to that one. Here's another thing I want to identify for everyone as well. When I talk about artifacts around a particular event, this is MITRE's attack matrix. If you're not familiar with this and you're on the blue or red team side, do me a favor and just Google attack matrix 2018 and you will find enough reading for the rest of the year in order to talk about what this matrix is. But it's basically the different types of steps attackers will take inside of an environment and the various ways that they may perform that, the various ways they may do that. And I'm sure if you haven't seen this graph before, you can just quickly walk through the different categories there. Let me show you something cool about event log clearing. That is event log clearing. Indicator removal from host. Now, you could probably expand a couple more of these. Um, you may have something, you know, like uh, indicator removal from tools or, um, let's see, disabling security tools or things like that. But for the most part, clearing of event logs is a couple boxes in this entire matrix. So don't ever, ever, ever utter the phrase, the event logs are not there, therefore I can't do this investigation. Because you have all those other artifacts to take a look at. You've got other host-based information. You've got network traffic. It, hopefully you're collecting network traffic. You've got logs from other systems. If I'm moving to a system, that means I had to come from a system. If I've got one pivot point, that means I'm coming into the environment. There are multiple places you can look. Do not get held up by this one particular artifact. There's tons of other places to go. All right, and with that, that brings me to the end of today's presentation. Again, everyone, this was part one in part, uh, in part one of a two-part series. Next week, we're going to take the discussion of missing event logs even further and talk about how I can use the lack of event logs and how I can use these other system artifacts to find evidence of lateral movement within an environment. There's a registration link available, but with that, thank you all again for joining me. Uh, I appreciate it. Carol, I will hand it back to you to see if there's any questions. All right, thanks, Matt, for that great presentation. Uh, we do have some questions ready for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for Matt, please enter it into the questions window now. Our first question, Matt, it came in at about 9 o'clock. It says, is that a capture screen from volatility? And if you're not sure what the referencing, we can. Uh, I, I can say that all of the command line, um, all of the command line screenshots, and, and I, I, think, I think I know which one they're referring to, but all of the command line screenshots that are in this presentation, yes, were from volatility, minus obviously the, the Mimi Cats ones. But I, I'm gonna, I think this is the one that they're referring to, Carolyn. And uh, to the attendee, if this is the one you're referring to, yes, this is a volatility screenshot, the SVC scan plugin. Yes, they verified that is the one. Thank you. Perfect. Um, no problem. The next, <laughs> the next question is can you undo that patch so event logs start working again? Uh, the Mimikatz, I'm assuming that question is referring to the Mimikatz patch. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, that's actually a point in time uh, thing that takes place. So if you were to restart, and, and again, I haven't tested this thoroughly. Um, I know it's a point in time change that takes place. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, if you restart the system, um, uh, you know, if the system goes through a reboot or, or potentially if the service goes through a restart itself, it actually may reload fully and correctly. Um, I don't believe it is a hard-coded patch that alters the state of event logs forever. However, I will ask attendees not to hold me on that. That's, that's actually one thing that I want to test is to see um, if that patch is persistent or not. But uh, again, to the best of my knowledge, it's a point-in-time patch. 
Um, and if you restart the system or the service, uh, things should take over normally. But you know that that may change as I as I test it further. Good question, though. All right, thanks. What OS versions does the Mimikatz drop slash clear work on? Windows 7 or 10? Uh, so I tested it on Windows 7. Um, the system that the, the VM that I was running and tested it in was a Windows 7 one. Um, I have no reason to believe it wouldn't work in others. Obviously, when we get into Windows 8 and above, there's um, a lot more different permissions and protections inside of memory. Um, I will have to say that's another thing, uh, operational or operating system compatibility is uh, what I'll be looking to test. However, I believe, and again, I'm referring to the Mimikatz blog here, I believe the blog actually does uh, does run through it on a Windows 10 system. Um, but uh, seeing as, you know, stealing credentials from protected memory space is one thing, um, I, I do not believe that the handling of the event log DLL is treated entirely differently between seven, you know, eight and 10. Um, so I would imagine it would likely work, but uh, again, something else to be tested. All right, thanks. How do we catch the attacker using drop from, from Mimikatz? Using drop from Mimikatz? Well, that's a, so really good question is, is how do I, how do I detect the attacker dropping these, uh, dropping these, you know, dropping this patch in, if you will, for, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, there's a couple ways to do that. Number one, and this is kind of what I was alluding to with other artifacts around an event taking place. If Mimikatz shows up on a system, and it's, again, as straightforward as, you know, Mimikatz, the PowerShell version, or, or Mimikatz.exe, or whatever it may be, you should know about it. Um, the SOC or the host monitors, the system administrators, should know about it. Things like these very, very well-known indicators uh, should be alerted on. You know, mimikatz.exe. Every time I see mimikatz.exe in, in some sort of evidence of history or, or on a desktop or in a folder somewhere, um, there's no question in my mind as, as to what that may be, right? There's no legitimate version I could confuse it with or anything. There's just one mimikatz. Um, so I, I would say don't think about how I detect the drop first off. Think about how I detect the mimikatz first. Um, once we've figured out how to detect the Mimi cats, then let's get into the event drop and how we can detect that. And um, I, I have not gone through enough of the Mimi cats code to know it to the granular level of invoke phantom, but I would imagine it's probably doing some sort of uh, in-memory altering or some sort of um, DLL altering or service altering, which is, you know, again, in time and making that take place. Um, what I would probably look at doing, and which I'm going to add to my testing here, is to monitor the system at a granular level and see exactly what Mimikatz is changing. There's a possibility that whatever the drop command changes, we could monitor for that. Again, you know, we're getting into use of Sysmon and Procmon where we've got to maintain that granular level of execution, or sorry, that granular level of monitoring of execution. But again, I would say the short answer, Carol, is to focus on detecting the Mimikatz first. All right, thank you. Um, does Mimikatz drop function patch the DLL on disk, in memory, or both? Again, um, that uh, is something to be tested. My, my, my understand, without digging into the C code for Mimikatz, which I have not done for this particular function, um, I don't know the exact answer to that. I, I will find it out in testing, and hopefully I can actually deliver it on next week's webcast in, in a, in a follow-up like answer. I would believe that it likely drops it or probably patches it in memory. Um, I would have to imagine that tampering with the uh, Windows event log DLL would cause some long-term issues. So I'm going to say it probably happens uh, in memory, but again, something to be to be tested and determined. But as far as I know, the uh, particular DLL itself does not appear to be uh, not appear to be modified. Thanks. Uh, should event logs be cleared on personal PCs as a best practice for safety? So when you say for safety, um, I'm I'm curious as to what you're clearing event logs for. Um, and now there is one instance. There's there's one, and let me answer this question in two ways. Number one, I personally do not recommend anyone clear event logs, um, primarily because you never know. Even from a home diagnostic point of view, you never know when you may need them. Um, and they're built-in part of Windows. There's reserve space for them. 
Um, you know, unless you've got a, a system that's really pushing max limits, I, I would prefer you go buy a, a, another hard drive as opposed to clearing event logs because you'll never know when you may need them. Um, the only instance where I do recommend that someone clear event logs and it's with other steps in place is sometimes folks will have um, script block logging or process auditing in place. So those 4688 events or those PowerShell logs. And unfortunately, they've passed credentials in clear text. Um, or they've done very minimal encoding on said credentials, in which case the event log viewer then technically has plain text credentials in it. Those I would recommend getting rid of because you don't want to, you don't want to make an attacker's job easy where if they compromise the system, they can just load up an event viewer. But I can't think of a situation where it's something I would do just for the heck of it. Um, or, you know, for any, any reason other than, uh, you know, to free, to free up space or to see what happens. When you do it, I wouldn't make it a normal practice, though. All right, thanks, Matt. Uh, with Invoke Phantom, can you see any evidence that the threads for the event log service have been killed in the memory image? So that's going to depend on how close you are to the running of Invoke Phantom um, with regards to the memory image. The easiest answer would be, um, and again, I've gone back to the Invoke Phantom screenshot here on the uh, on the webcast. If you're watching. Um, if you notice, the screenshot here was perfectly taken by the tool's author, and you can see the red of the of the uh, threads about to be killed. Um, very similar to other memory objects, those threads have a structure to them. Um, so it may be possible, uh, depending again on proximity to the event, that you could find evidence of those threads in memory. Um, you may be able to, you know, do a scan for a, a thread scan and, and see if you can come across those those items. Um, but the, the biggest the, the biggest answer, the biggest caveat there is it depends on how close you are. What the other thing that you may find evidence of as well is um, if the invoke phantom script was dropped on the system, um, was placed on there or was executed in some way, shape or form. Again, that speaks to like PowerShell module logging. You may have if you have that enabled. Um, now, of course, it's kind of like a catch 22, right? If I disable if I disable the thread for PowerShell module logging, do I log the module that actually disabled the thread, right? At what point does it actually stop? So there's there's kind of a scenario you may get caught in there. I'd say look for the script. Um, in memory, you may find evidence of it. You may even find the command line or the output inside of memory, but you also may find the thread objects as well. Um, Matt, someone asks if you can display the registry key again. I'm not sure if you've done that sure. already, but. I will jump back to that really quick. There we go. All right, thanks. Uh, with PowerShell logging, would you see invoke phantom line before it disrupted event logging? Yeah, so that's, that's funny. That was, that was exactly the mental thing I was trying to understand there. Um, without, without knowing the exact sequence of events with regards to um, the execution of invoke phantom and I guess basically the, the biggest the biggest hurdle I'd, I'd imagine having to get over there is time. Um, if I run invoke phantom and it kills all the event log threads, you know, within within a, let's say two milliseconds, right? Does it kill a thread that was writing evidence of itself? Um, that that I don't know. So it depends, I think, on script execution. It's going to depend on the level of logging that's in place as well. Um, you may catch. The initial part, you may catch a little bit of it, but I would probably be a little, I'd probably lean more towards the script would likely eradicate evidence of itself being written to an event log. Um, but again, that's, you know, potentially something else to be tested there, but that's, that's a very time-based um, caveat as well. It depends on how fast the tool is able to operate, and it also depends on the level of logging that's been enabled as well. But I, I could see a potential where you may catch some of Invoke Phantom prior to the threads being killed. All right, uh, Matt, do you have more time for a couple more questions? I can, yep, I got a couple more, no problem. Okay, if Mimikatz is not detected, can it be detected with DLL injection or something <laughs> as it can be customized or in memory as well? And most of the time it goes undetected. Correct, yeah, so um, you're right. Uh, I've focused primarily on, or I guess the, the, the person who asked that question is right, that there's not just mimikatz.exe. There are definitely other variants and other ways that it, that it can be executed and run on a system. Um, I, I, again, 
without knowing the exact steps that are taken, and this is something I hope to have next week. So if, you, if you're looking for the answer to how that's working, um, I will have a follow-up kind of first couple slides next week. We'll talk about what Mimikatz is actually doing when you're running that drop command on the system. Um, without knowing exactly what that looks like, um, I would I would hesitate to, to give a definitive, yes, it can be detected in this way. So, so more testing may lead to that. But the one thing I will say is Mimikatz in any form, um, you know, if it's DLL injection, I can detect that in a memory dump. Um, if it's taking advantage of other processes, if it's being downloaded in obfuscated form, if it's coming down line by line via PowerShell or bits or whatever it may be, um, there's always a way to kind of find those artifacts or, or to detect something going on. Um, but again, you know, it gets more and more confusing as time goes on. So with regards to the particular Mimikatz drop command, um, you would likely be able to pick up some DLL meddling that is taking place. Um, if you've got that level of monitoring, I know some endpoint products do monitor system 32 folder and, and look for tampering, but I don't think this is happening on disk. So you're likely left with memory forensics at that point. All right. Um, are there similar event logs in Mac OS and methods to compromise and forensics for detecting such compromise? Yeah, so I, I mean, there are there is definitely logging mechanisms inside of the Mac system. Um, I will be the first person to admit I am not 100% sure how easy those Mac systems can be cleared as compared to Windows systems. Um, and if, if anyone watching does Mac forensics, you know that we just, a, APFS just walked on the scene. So everything we thought we knew just got changed around. Um, I would have to imagine that with enough privileges, you could likely do the same type of disruption on a Mac system and remove a lot of the historical logs. Um, but admittedly, I'm not sure how tight Apple has those uh, those artifacts wound up. All right. Uh, what free enterprise tools are there that can monitor when a registry key is edited and is reported to a collector or SIM? So the first place I'd go for anyone looking to do uh, free or looking for free monitoring tools is go to your sys internal suite. Um, look for things like Sysmon. Uh, there's a lot of reference to this, and it's quite frankly one of the best setups out there. Um, if anyone's familiar with the Swift on Security Twitter account, there uh, that account has, or that individual has published a Sysmon configuration that's one of the most useful out there. That is a tool that you can use to get granular level monitoring of a system. Um, I a lot of the screenshots that I were showing were from Process Monitor and Process Explorer. Um, I would not recommend ingesting all of that data all the time because you'll fill up all those nice new, new hard drives very, very quickly. Um, what I would do instead is, is say, you know, there are free monitoring tools out there. System Internals is the first place I would go because it allows for awesome data collection and easy forwarding as well. Remember, you've got built-in event logs that you can also forward. You don't need to go and buy a, a sensor or a forwarder. They can handle it and, and do it by default. Go take a look at Microsoft Windows Event Collections and whatnot. That's a free tool that you can use. Um, you know, you can ingest those into free SIMs. If you want, and by free SIM, I really mean like a free aggregator, like an Elk Stack or a, uh, you know, a free tier Splunk or something like that. And, and you can get kind of a little bit of visibility there. Um, and for a lot of shops that are just starting out, maybe don't have much fun, um, I'll, I'll revert back to my previous advice, which is, you know what, if you can't afford to turn on logging everywhere, um, you know, understand you've got to get money and funds and resources to be able to do that. I would go to the data that matters first, go to the stuff that if it walked out the door would cause fines, would cause regulators and lawyers to show up or would damage the company's reputation and wrap the monitoring around those systems. That's where you want to be paying the most attention to and then expand out from there when you get some familiarity with the data. All right, Matt, and this will be our last one for today. Uh, what's the best way to scale collecting event logs from every endpoint, preferably on a budget, or are there certain event log types we should just be collecting? Yep. So, the, it, again, we're, without knowing the, for the person who asked that question, without knowing the throughput, bandwidth, and capabilities of your network, the easiest and cheapest way to forward event logs is to utilize the operating system to forward said event logs. Um, there are some sys internals tools that can help out with that as well. So, the short answer is native tools and sys internals, which is, again, you know, kind of native, but Microsoft. Get those things integrated and utilize those tools um, to go across the wire. From an enterprise-wide perspective, you know, whenever you talk about doing things at an enterprise-wide perspective, the first thing you have to you have to respond and deal with is deployment. Um, 
how, and by deployment, I don't mean pushing an agent out. I mean, how can I effectively enable all of my, uh, all of my systems to start reporting event logs back? So that's where you go again, live off your own land. Do you have GPO in place? Can you control policies from one place that affects, you know, hundreds or thousands of systems at a time? With regards to logs that I should focus on, um, I will say that if you don't have the space or if you're looking to run a little bit more lean, you do not need to monitor all 400 logs at a time. A lot of logs are, are written on the system and they stay on the system and they get updated you know, every now and then. Microsoft's application user experience, for example, is something that is not gonna get updated as frequently as the security event log. Um, what I would focus on instead is go back to that MITRE attack matrix. I'm gonna hop over there in the uh, webcast really quick for anyone still watching. I would take the event logs that correspond with the various parts of the attack matrix or event logs that correspond to where you are most concerned about your organization. So if you're most concerned about lateral movement because you know RDP is open, make sure you ingest those RDP logs. Definitely the security logs because security is gonna be the really the key to account usage, to password stealing, hash usage, so on and so forth. Um, if you're nervous about scheduled tasks, if you're worried about those being abused, then grab those. So, Carol, I think it's a combination of line your logs up with what your attackers may be doing and also line them up with what you have exposed in your network and what you're most concerned about. All right. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcast. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.